Thanks for tuning in to the Crescent Method. This is Scott and Sarah. Today we're doing another interview with a good friend of ours on a new segment we're calling The Network. Um, our guest tonight is a, is a friend who has been for a while that I met about 10 years ago when I was starting this journey as Scott, the Crescent Soil Guy. And our next guest was a, um, a, a graphic designer graduate and actually made my first business cards. And um, she went off to Colorado, to the land of marijuana, to start her journey as a cannabis consumer, not cannabis consumer, but cannabis advocate, cannabis cultivator. Um, our guest has also gone through the Dr. Lane Soil Food Web system and has also been a um, contributing member to our growers group and also to uh, is also a student of our own master classes. And so we're firing up the uh, 2023 masterclass sessions, and we figured it'd make sense to bring on one of our masterclass students. So we'd like to welcome our good friend Space Cat, who is a soil food web um, microscope lab and just general badass. So without further ado. <laughs> <laughs> Thank welcome. you. I appreciate the compliment. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Welcome our good friend Space Cat. So Thank you. you know, I met I met Kat here, like I said, about 10 years ago. We were actually in the surf and skate industry. Kat was a sponsored skateboarder, and I was a team leader of a, another skate team. And she was hauling ass down the mountain about 60 miles an hour at a point in time when fools were going plumb crazy. I was not <laughs> at all going 60 miles an hour, but it was a really cool time in history where like a leap in technology led to a radical leap inability and in the cannabis soil food web uh farming culture we're having similar leaps in technology that is now leading to a radical leap in the ability of the cultivator and so we wanted to bring kat on today to talk a little bit about her journey what it's been like going through the soil food web system and ultimately our master class and what she's up to now so i guess i'll let you uh give a little bit of background if you'd like um on, sure. you know, just kind sure. of the general journey that got you to here. Yeah, no, like Scott said, like t he said, 10 years ago, we met 10 years ago, I had moved to Colorado with the intent of actually, I graduated with a degree in graphic design. So my intent was as a cannabis advocate to work for different dispensaries and do different, um, like whatever kind of like promo design advertisement I could, but instead I would try the product and realize that it was giving me migraines or is it causing me some kind of throat issue? And I didn't know anything about growing cannabis at that point. I was just solely a consumer. And uh, I just asked questions to my manager because at that time, Colorado had it where the grow and the dispensary could be attached all to the same spot. So literally you just walk through a door and there's the grow, walk through the other door, there's the store and so forth. So now it's not the case anymore. Colorado's made that separate, but, um, before then, like I said, you could see the plants and I'd ask like, why is this like this? And every time I'd be told like, oh, we have to flush. We didn't flush soon enough or we did this or we did that. And it had always had to do something with like synthetic feed revolve around. And then in my head, I thought like, well, is that what's giving me the migraines then? Because if I'm smoking something that's natural, I shouldn't be getting a migraine immediately after. Usually I'm smoking <laughs> it because I want to relieve the migraine or because I want to relieve the self sickness too. Because even so, like I'm hearing um, like fellow patient, like fellow medical users, because that's the thing, like as much as I use it recreationally, I also use it highly for medical purposes too. So, you know, it's kind of one of those things of it's like, um, what's in my box cake? Is it like some weird stuff that I can't pronounce or is it something that's natural? So I just kind of took that same aspect into the cannabis of trying to figure out like what was going on. So uh, at some point I got a job as a trimmer. I thought that was my first step to like get into the garden and figure out like, what are people doing in the cannabis industry that's causing them to need a flush, you know, yeah. or causing them to need to use some kind of PM management method that doesn't feel great, you know, to use as a patient, you know, I can understand, uh, you know, the, the hard part about legal cannabis is it did derive 
uh, Walmart marijuana. So there's yeah. plenty of cultivators in Colorado and other states that they do not care what's in the product. They do not care the end product. They don't care if it makes you more sick. They just care that you give them money. So, uh, yeah, I don't know. Like I said, I just got my intro as a trimmer, uh, then eventually worked my way into the garden. It's kind of one of those things where you have to like kind of prove yourself that you can listen when you're trimming. <laughs> That's usually the big step first. And then you start hearing them talk about how uh, they don't have enough employees to wash pots or yeah. they need someone to help transplant. So then that's when you start saying, hey, I can I can like be available to do those things. So uh, yeah, and then at some point um, I got into a grow that allowed me to have my own space. They kind of saw the passion and the potential that I had. So they allowed me to run a room of my own that had about 130 plants at a time. It was only for flowering. So I usually got them later in life. I joked that I was more of like the before and during hospice care. I'm just trying to get them from their teenage to adult to fruiting and then harvest them. And uh, I learned a lot in that space. Uh, and in that space too, that was my first introduction to what people in that day and age called living soil. And yeah. at that same time point, Scott uh, was talking about taking the Dr. Lane courses himself and asking to see samples because I'm telling him about like the plethora of problems that I'm seeing. I don't know anything, you know, at this point, I'm a brand new grower and I'm like, I don't know, we've been here for six months and I've never <laughs> not seen powdery mildew on a plant right. or I've never not seen fungus gnats. Now we're having russet mites and we're spraying um, perithium oil more than we should be. And I'm like, I don't understand what's going on. And yeah. that was kind of like more of my first introduction into uh, the powers of the microscope and the knowledge that the microscope can give you, not from a personal aspect, but um, from just speaking with Scott at that time point, sending him samples, him performing counts on those samples and giving me back this graphic data that like still to this day, I look at it because that's like my why of like, here I was in this grow that was silly infested. It was almost eat infested. They were doing a lot of things that they shouldn't have been doing. And I didn't know any better, but also there was no way I could implement anything. The moment that I said something to the owner of that grow, uh, you know, just about like, it wasn't even anything attacking them. It was just like, hey, there's this thing called a microscope that we can use to like better determine if our compost teas are viable or if what's in the soil that's happening is actually happening or are we just killing it all because it's becoming, uh, you know, at one point the soil became just like a desert, you know, like what's that term of, uh, <laughs> I think right now, but just like the water just no law, it just can't take the water because it's so dry, it just won't even take it. So it just it just became really bad really quickly and I didn't understand. So um yeah, but that obviously didn't get reciprocated well. So yeah. <laughs> to you know, that's just how it goes in the cannabis industry. Um when a master grower is very set on their ways. They like don't want to I mean that person even laughed at me when I brought up the idea of cover crop just right. asking the basic question like oh have you ever heard of cover cropping you know and just being laughed at like it's some crazy wook idea and i'm like <laughs> you know it's like wait a minute <laughs> it just seems practical what do you mean <laughs> yeah I, but anyways so then yeah. after that point i just like had a pretty strong like in self intent that i was no longer going to work in a grow facility and that retribute you know uh that just lies to patients, I guess you yeah. could say. Uh, so I've just been pretty advocate of my own. Um, just, you know, I think the biggest thing I got from Colorado was learning how to work in the legalized, uh, what do you call it? Um, you know, like in the legalized market, there's all these certain, certain parameters you have to be able to hit. So like including passing microbials, which living soil at that time, was always getting slammed because they're like, there's no way you could do living soil because there's no way you could pass microbials. So then it's like me, I'm just like, well, hold my bong and watch this. So 
<laughs> I hunkered down for like, what was it? The last three years, I hunkered down in a four by four tent, worked with Scott and Sarah in the growers group, making sure that I was getting regular bio essay, you know, um, mineral balance, and then also trying to learn to be self-sufficient in that same time point. I mean, that's really what drove me to take the soil food web course. It was nice that I had Scott and Sarah as this resource to be able to look at the microscope for me, but I, I, I'm i stubborn and I want to look too. So that's kind of how I was at where, you know, my drive at that point was just, you know, work on my small four by four, develop some microscopy skills, and then just keep cultivating those skills as I go forward. And, uh, and yeah, so. Which is paying off now because, you know, we'll get to it in just a minute, but the, sure. the longer, the short of it is you're now building out as a main designer of your own commercial cultivation facility, which is pretty awesome. And so. No, it is. That, yeah. Yeah. Sorry. I just got a cough. Sorry. Oh, no. Okay. No, but, it's um, really nice too. Yeah. Go ahead. Sorry. Yeah. And, you know, along that journey, there was a lot of opportunities for learning, I guess we could say. And, you know, I remember when, you know, I had just completed the Elaine classes. I was applying my microscope methods with success. You were, having some obstacles at this work environment. And, you know, very common to our work at the time was that information was not well received or even reacted upon. And the conversation I remember you and I had is like, okay, well, this farm isn't interested in reacting to this microscope data. They're continuing to spray chemicals that are not allowed in regulated spaces, definitely not within the ethos of living soil for sure. Um, and, and I remember you said, how can I at least stop these russet mites from following me home to my personal garden? Because it makes perfect sense. A lot of cultivators do exactly at their home gardens what they're doing in the commercial facilities. It makes a lot of sense, right? And we made those changes in your personal garden. And if I remember correctly, you were running a 600 watt Gavita. And in that first change, you hit over a gram per watt, which is pretty solid. Correct. Yeah. No, I that, doubled my yeah. yield just from switching because before <laughs> I was following the regiment that the facility I was working for was doing. So that was like different various of bottled nutrients, some of which I found uh, drove water to <laughs> be down to like a four pH, you know, but that was only something I learned from self discovery, not from, you know, the mentor of that space, you know. Um, but yeah, no, I just cut doing whatever the bottle nutrient was. And we just went down to basics. And it was really simple. It was really just compost extracts. And at that point, because um, uh, I didn't really have all the like bags and devices before, at that point, I was running pretty low tech. I mean, that's the big thing is like, I, I started very low tech. I didn't have much funds or income to put into it. So if all I could afford was to put a scoop of compost on the top and water it for a week or so forth, um, changing to like the aloe powder, I don't know, like, you know, there's like different advice mm -hmm. that Scott had given me over the years. Um, just even like getting the soil minerally balanced itself, making sure the biological balance was good. And like I said, in that first harvest, I doubled my yield and I didn't have any bugs in my plants and, mm -hmm. you know, kind of had to give the door closed to that other facility because right. like I said, they don't want to listen. It's, it's not even like that. I feel like I had to be listened to by any means. It's more of like, Hey, we're a facility with a lot of problems and the solution you're going to is no different than what the hydro guys are doing. So if that's yeah. the case, I have no problem buying like as the consumer, like that's the funny thing. Like I'm a grower, but I'm also the consumer. So as the consumer, if I know that the organic product is using the same IPM management as the hydro growers, I'll probably still buy the hydro growers product because the price points there and it's, and it's the end same quality. It's not, yeah. it's not doing anything different, whether this has polyrhythm oil or that, or neem or that, you know what I'm saying? They both are mm -hmm. using the same IPM regimen. So, and, and I kind of teased that, like, at least with the hydro guys, I feel like they're a little bit more honest because right. they're like, Oh, well, I just use, this line of product or i use mm -hmm. that line of product and then in my head i can be like okay i know what you basically do with your plants so i'm not mm -hmm. i don't know it's kind of like a long run around of just saying that the organic just seems to be just the same as the salt people at that right. point right it's it and didn't really feel like it was organic anymore or 
clean so medicine for the patients. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> it definitely wasn't. And, and the situation around that particular farm is really common in our work where they're really deeply entrenched in an activity. And in this particular farm, it was, you know, really long T brews, all kinds of nonsense in there with dirty valves and simply stopping that in your personal garden made pretty radical changes to be able to get quite quickly away from russet mites without taking radical changes. And we're starting to see the market more open, I guess we could say to the concept that primarily I would say some of the biggest issues in living soil are tea brewing practices, um, which people get the most entrenched in. And that that's really interesting how people behave that way. And the thing that I appreciate the most about the microscope methods is it allows you to stand to the side of how you feel about things, plain and simple. And, you know, for me, I, I, I like that aspect of it. And that's how I use it most. And but a lot of farmers struggle to make that transition, I guess we'll say, um, from the things that they're doing that are leading to pests and disease and often low yields to abandoning some of the things that they have the most emotions about that will then lead to a greater outcome. And that, you know, for those of you out there that have desires to go all the way through the consultant training program, um, you know, in Katie's situation, she is... Um, now designing her own facility based on the lessons that she's learned along the way. I think one of the most important things that you've done along the way is, you know, approach it like an athlete, approach it like a skater, approach it like a scientist that <laughs> used every opportunity to the fullest extent. You don't need a hundred lights to learn. A simple four by four tent offers plenty of opportunity for you to build the foundation of understanding. And I think one of the things that you've done exceptionally well is exactly that and um so i don't know if there's anything along the way in those tents that really were some maybe aha moments or something about how the soil food web school and education or even maybe our master classes led to this incremental development yeah. and adjustment i think would be really interesting yeah no it, i mean it's really helped me a lot because before you know i mean it, it's I, I do appreciate you bring up the sport aspect because like you know you talked about being a softball coach i was the softball player i was the one who was spending uh you know time drilling in the in the uh batting cages practicing my different bunts and my bunt slides and and like softball is a mental game too and in order to know like whether or not you're you know being a good athlete you collect data points and that's like the biggest thing that i appreciated through the soil food web and taking the crest of math uh, courses is the data point collection you know and that's what allows you to get away from the emotions you know mm -hmm. um, even as a player you know you can be upset and be like oh why am i not doing so great it's like well this other player is every time they're up to bat they they're always on base are you always on base when you're at bat no you know it's that same aspect of okay um my plants aren't reacting right okay so let's go back to basics um what's the biology look like now that i have the ability to check out the biology myself even if i don't sit there and perform a full account i can at least look and be like okay well i am seeing some ciliates and i am seeing um, some oma seats so i should probably be alarmed and i could send a sample to scott and sarah for a further in-depth look and i actually like that too just as a new student to like keep myself calibrated of, okay, I performed a count. These are the results I got. Sarah and Scott performed the count. They got the same results. Okay. I'm what I'm seeing is what, you know, they're seeing and so forth. So I really liked that, that, um, you know, it's like that mentorship and that guidance. I will say the biggest thing is like, like I said before, I started as a graphic design graduate. So I'm a visual learner and I've tried, uh, other people's courses. I won't say like, the name or whatever, but I've tried other soil mineral balance courses in which um, they're not descriptive enough. Like I need somebody on a whiteboard doing the math for me. And then I really appreciated that the mineral balancing courses were like that. Um, and that there is this catalog of videos that I can go back to. So that any time that I'm confused or I'm lost on something, there's like that support. Um, and that's helped a lot in my garden, like I said, because I've been able to try and tribute different things of, okay, well, maybe this time, you know, I don't 
compost tea extract as often as I did before, if it's once a week. Well, then you start looking in the microscope and you notice your biology is just like not advancing enough. So then you're like, okay, well, let's go back to that once, a, that once a week. But what if I tried two times a week, you know, like you try to push that envelope. It's just like skating too. It's like, how fast can I go down this road before I, you know, Superman and get road rash, uh, <laughs> you know, but in the plant sense, it's more of like the plant starts burning or curling or you know, I like that's the biggest thing I liked about the four by four space is that when you mess up in a four by four space, it does not feel as much of a failure when you mess up in a space that has 130 plants right. and you fed it too much uh, potassium because you just threw it in there blindly based on what the bag said. And now all your plants are sad and you're flushing for the night, you know, or yeah. I don't know. So, um, yeah, that that's just helped me a lot to like collect data within what I'm doing and not have emotions towards it. And that helps a lot with, um, you know, I'm in this age of Instagram, you know, I was born with technology in my hand and having influencers have different things of what they think is true and not true. And I know that any time I question whether a method is true or not, I just go back to the data collecting, you know, it's like run the experiment, look at the microscope, collect the mineral, you know, collect the Logan lab mineral, uh, biology and stuff like that. So, yeah. Mm -hmm. Um, yeah, it's pretty know. empowering yeah, it's what you can do. It's the data collecting that really is tried and true through it all, because that's the only way I can separate my emotions from other people's emotions too. You know, they right. could get upset as they want and I could just be like, well, you say you're doing nit nitrogen, you know, uh, nutrient cycling but then your plant has purple stems. So right. it's like, what's wrong? Is it the biology or is it the mineral balance? And yeah. I don't know, in the commercial space, a lot of people don't even ask that question. They just follow the bottle nutrients. They're like, there's these 12 products I use and they all tell me to use this parts per gallon and I just use it blindly and I don't even question mm -hmm. <laughs> what's yeah, happening. It's, it, it's shocking how few hydroponic farms even do basic levels of analysis. and. You know, I, I think one of the biggest advantages of living soil is you can quantify very specifically pretty much everything. I mean, you can quantify things about hydroponics as well, but, you know, in living soil, it's a tremendous advantage to be able to manage biological populations and the ratios between predators and prey, which will drive growth rates, which will drive, like you said, purple stems or green stems. Um, some of my favorite soil food web moments along the journey was early on when we started to get good at getting those biological populations correct. And you'd have a plant that was purple stemmed and like a hard line in the sand, it would grow green above that. Like as soon as you hit that population of predator prey interactions or, you know, pr beneficial protozoa to bacteria. Um, one particular farm I can remember, he had this variety called Locomotion, which was one of the most purple plants I've ever seen. And he was a general hydroponics grower that was tinkering with living soil and started converting his facility. And within a week or two, that plant that had historically been fairly solid purple stems started growing green. And the farmer actually panicked. He's like, you ruined my genetics. I'm like, no, man, it's about to get good. Like this plant, <laughs> this plant is purple and hungry and you're currently starving it. And we're solving that starvation through biological treatments. And this thing's about to yield way more than you'd have ever expected. And it actually made him extremely uncomfortable. And um, he honestly ended up kind of falling off and really thought we ruined those genetics which uh, I would have loved to see what would have happened if that plant would grow with green stems because they already yeah, loved it with solid purple, you know? Yeah, it's, it's funny you say that because I've seen that too in a sense of like, you know, that grow that I talked about before, we were always having some kind of purple spent stems or some kind of like, you could always tell there was some kind of imbalance. Mm -hmm. And the only way uh, at that facility that we were checking any kind of microscope balance or not um, microscope, but mineral balance uh, was by those little tablets. I don't know if you've ever seen the little pill capsules and the little like plastic oh, yeah. uh, thing. And there's like literally a uh, different like solution in each of those pills and based on what color is like your trend testing for n p and k 
And it's like, you would see that, you know, what was it? Phosphorus, because it takes the longest to break down. When you would use those pills, that one would always be the darkest blue ever. And blindly, the grower is just like, we'll just throw more kelp on it. It's fine. Just throw more of this on it. It's, it's fine. And honestly, like, you know, stepping back and focusing on what Cressa pushes, which is, you know, making sure that the mineral is imbalanced as well. Because that is something that you miss from the soil food web, of course, because Elaine is not much of a proponent for it. And in her coursework, she even talks about, you know, not being a proponent for it. But it doesn't mean that information is not still valuable. Like Correct. that coursework was really valuable for me to see what Scott and Sarah have been seeing this entire time, because it probably took me about five years, like after Scott became proficient. Then like, it's like, you know, it's like, you know, five years later, now I'm at this position where I'm freshly, um, you know, I've only been a lab student, uh, lab graduate for about a year now. And even still, like, I don't really feel confident all the time at what, you know, what I'm counting. So I'm always recounting and so forth. So there's always that like rechecking and recalibrating yourself. Um, yeah. And I will say like, that's, that's kind of why I, like um, stream it sometimes because it's almost as a way of like, me um collecting you know those uh repetition in the batting cages like yeah, i want to be yeah. more proficient at the microscope <laughs> the only way to be more proficient at it is, is just keep looking at samples even if it changed only a little bit from the day before that little bit is a drastic change to me you know if i look at the soil one day and i see one nematode per slide and then i look the next day and i'm seeing three i'm like holy moly you know <laughs> things are progressing progressing as you know i would hope they should if if there's this um enough food that the you know the nematodes want to reproduce and and just keep living in the soil system which is some something that some people don't even elaborate you know that that same grow that i used to work for is still a proponent to saying that they need to change their soil every three years well i had soil for three years that i ran with scott and sarah that i was sad to even let go when i moved states away <laughs> because they already knew that it was biologically there, it was minerally there, and any time I put plants in it, they were always happy. Even if I, there was even a time where I vegged plants in a different product of compo or soil from a different company, and that plant started showing health problems. So I put it in my four by four, and within a week, they relieved themselves. So you know, it's, it's that true factor of like, once you put the so uh, the plant in the medium of which everything is, is in balance, that plant can really thrive. And that's really helpful for me as well. Because like I said, I've never had like a whole lot of money to put into this. So um, if I don't have to spend, you know, money wasting on compost that's going to end up just killing my plants, then, you know, I can save that effort when, um, you know, while I'm taking courses from Scott and Sarah, when they're, you know, giving you that information of what to look for when you're looking for soil or what to look for when you're looking for compost and how to, you know, kind of empower yourself. That's really what it is. It's like empowering yourself to make the right consumer decision of what am I going to purchase within my area. And it's kind of nice, too, because I just went through the process of being in one state and finding what's sustainably available to me in that state to grow cannabis. And now I'm in a new state where I find, you know, my new sources of where am I getting my aeration? Where am I getting, mm. you know, my compost? And, you know, I, even, Scott would even say, I had to make the, the economical decision of, well, there's no good compost in my area of that caliber. So mm. we're going to ship it on a truck because, shipping that on the truck means that i can keep my soil for longer than three years and i can keep letting that soil be a workhorse for me as long as i just keep top and amend, uh, amending it and stuff like that and keeping track of that so yeah. yeah it's so crazy like just the concept of throwing out soil like you know i come from the area of buying pallets of fox farm soils burning a bunch of floor nova trying to find a place in the city to dump it and it was like pure insanity from my viewpoint. And um, I remember the first time I heard this concept of permanent soils, I was like, wow, this is a solution right here. But I certainly did not know what was needed to not have a soil go to shit. And, you know, many people with their current system will try to save the soil and it goes to hell quick. And 
I think the real interesting part about cannabis in particular is we've had so many years of buying soil, heavily fertilizing it, whether with fish hydrolysate or biobiz or some other, you know, really thick, syrupy, very concentrated, potent organic nutrient that is extremely uh, destructive to soil structure. It's, you know, it, it's a big jump a lot of times for people to go from this model of cramming tons of fish hydrolysate and other bottled products into this organic soil to shifting that. And we work with a lot of those farmers and it's a very big leap of faith for them. Um, and oftentimes they do struggle to not do things like pH adjusting their water. And, um, you know, so I, I think that's where the real advantage of the microscope methods and more importantly, having a microscope within your possession and having the ability yourself to look at it is you're now the guru. And I, I think that's a really important transition that farmers are making mostly in cannabis. You're starting to see it a little bit in conventional agriculture or more, uh, you know, market garden type stuff. Um, we just went to a farm and food convention that had a lot of market gardeners and large scale farmers, and they're starting to tinker. But compared to those of us, like even a uh, cat here, who's been, you know, farming in a four by four tent for a handful of years, I would say that your farming knowledge is easily, easily a hundred years ahead of the average food farmer or even the average market gardener. Um, you know, I think there's a lot of value that comes from people like Curtis Stone and Jam, J Jean Martin Fortier, and uh, what was the other guy? Campbell. There was another guy they mentioned. Can't remember his name. But nonetheless, all those you know <laughs> gurus of market gardening still dismiss soil testing, still dismiss biological testing. And when we were at this event this weekend, they think it's inefficient. They think it's inefficient, which is fascinating. Um, and <laughs> one of the small market gardeners that are following these. Um, pathways put by JM or Curtis Stone or whatever. And they were very honest and they said, things are great, but every now and then we get bugs that we don't understand. And I was just like, fam, I could tell you exactly why that's there and we could wipe it off your farm. And, you know, the interesting thing is when you talk to these people in the hallway, like, hey man, this is a simple fix. A lot of times their response is, well, we can't afford that or we can't afford consulting. It's like, I'm not even trying to sell you anything. I'm just telling you. And I think that's where cannabis has a major advantage over market gardeners and food farmers is that there's a very clear um, change in result when we put more effort in. And, you know, historically, there was much higher prices and profit. It's definitely not been that way for several years. And I would argue that the alfalfa farmers down the road have a much higher profit margin than the average cannabis farmer. And so it's a really interesting time to be alive where... Um, those that are growing our food seem afraid to put the effort in that somebody like Kat is doing with a literal space age farm with the leading technology and applying every natural principle possible. Now, I'm not saying spending the most money. I'm not saying doing more that's necessary. I'm just saying applying the microscope methods, managing soil chemistry to allow a certain outcome. And mm -hmm. You know, I'll be so bold to say that at some point, those that are growing our food are going to run into significant stumbling blocks, might likely go completely out of business. And it's going to be people like Kat, members like Aaron, members like Jared, members like David that are growing cannabis using these living soil techniques. They're going to step into that role of high production food crops. That's a whole different subject, but I just figured <laughs> since it came up, I'd let it come out. But I mean, that's kind of, I mean, that's kind of what know. my, I know it sounds silly, but if anyone who talks about doomsday and the end of the world, it's like, well, I'm set because right. I can grow food. I can grow my own produce. I can grow my own medicine, um, you know, regardless of, you know, I don't know, because I've grown in Colorado in which it's a state where it gets cold and snowy for a long period of time. It's just kind of like learning how to adapt within those like extreme situations. Um, 
and now I'm in, you know, in Colorado is extremely dry too, but it's interesting. You just mentioned about like your peers, you know, like not being on board with this, like even now, like it amazes me. Like I said, I've been on this journey for over 10 years and people are just starting to pick up the concept of living soil, mm -hmm. but the concepts that they're picking up are from, you know, um, other novice growers on Instagram, just kind of showing more than what's really there, I guess you could say. And people follow it because, you know, um, it seems cool, you know, like to them, like, oh, it seems cool that I could just use my leftover rice and make an IMO and I'm doing something right. I'm adding biology. Right. And uh, the hard part, too, is, is like you try to empower those people to get microscopes, but because they don't go through the Elaine microscope program, the soil food rep program, or even through the basic training courses that you guys give of why it's important to focus on aerobics opposed yeah. to anaerobics. Right now we have this, uh, this fad going on in the, in the industry in which anyone who jumps onto living soil and even gets a microscope jumps on to working with anaerobics. So anytime, yeah they're displaying any kind of microscopic work. It's usually a high count of ciliates, um, <clears throat> high counts of omocetes. One of the new fads right now is stalk ciliates, you know, and every time I look back into my soil food web education or the Cressive method education, I just think, well, why would they choose to work with stalk ciliates? And it's kind of interesting because we're in this age of technology where you can literally do a Google research of what are stock ciliates and it says they like to hang out in wastewater. So it's yeah. like, okay. Oh, so something that likes to hang out in literally human waste product water is what I'm supposed to be giving my plant. You know, it's like, it just, it just doesn't make sense when you see people jumping onto these fads um, but then that's where I appreciate my own line of education and of stubbornness of being like, what fermenting a what? I don't know what you're talking about. Mm -hmm. I'm looking at the microscope and I'm seeing how it reacts to the plants. You know, if, if we, you know, like I said, when Scott gave me that test results in that one facility that I worked at that had high powdery, powdery, powdery mildew, they also had high omacet levels. So right. it's just kind of like, how am I supposed to argue with the data on that of here I have this huge mold knowing microorganism that only wants to live in an area that has low oxygen and, and so forth. And my plants are showing the results. And then, yeah. you know, like he said, yeah. I, at home, I changed the method. I no longer had to be fearful of bugs. Actually, I almost get like an over sense of confidence sometimes when I go to other people's gardens and they're like, I'm sorry, I have russet mites right now. I'm like, I'm sorry, that's your problem. What do you want me to do? You know, they're like, well, I don't want you to take it home to your garden. I was like, I'll change my shirt and throw it in the wash, but I'm sure my garden will be okay because yeah. I checked the microscope yesterday and they're all doing real Gucci when it comes to yeah. having the right amount of protozoas, having the right amount of flagellates, having the right amount of nematodes, making sure that there's a high enough bacteria account so that those protozoas can actually sustain life and eat enough. You know, you don't, you know, it, it's finding that balance of you don't want the microbes to be fat and sassy and lazy, but you also <laughs> don't want them to be starving and fighting each other for resources. And you don't want them to have to fight ciliates for resources or some kind of anaerobic for resources and it, what's interesting is when you look in the microscope you really do understand why that there's that competition because when you see a protozoan um either it's a naked amoeba or a heliozoa which is my personal favorite they're mm -hmm. usually moving pretty slowly amongst the sample they're just kind of like slowly blopping their way to wherever they're trying to go to eat food while a ciliate is like a businessman of new york that doesn't have enough time in the day he's like i gotta go here i gotta go there i gotta go here here's food here here's food there so you know it's like when people want to be open to work with ciliates it's like well what are you doing though you're you're introducing all these fast-paced workers into a slow-paced environment and they're taking away all the resources from the mountain folks you know it's kind of it's kind of like in colorado like the mountain folks only have so much resources for their population because they only have so much people that live there when yeah. people from a big city come up like a cilia and eats all their food and resources, <laughs> then they're just kind of standing there like what? So it's almost like you're just trying to give the biology their best advantage of like, well, I don't want you have to compete for food. So just take right. the competition out and, you know, 
You know, the funny part so. about the russet mites is people are absolutely terrified of russet mites. And they're, I mean, man, it, I've seen people getting fistfights over it, thinking one guy brought it the other guy. And I think the real poetic oh. part about russet mites is they're microscopic. So it requires magnifying your eye to see them. And if you magnify your eye to the soil, it is the most obvious variation from ideal. I think, I think you can't get further away from ideal than russet mites, honestly. Um, from a biological standpoint, maybe broad mites, again, another extremely micro mite that requires the use of handheld magnification to even see the little buggers. And I think that's pretty poetic. And I would think that you could take a jar of russet mites, release them into this garden here, and I don't think that they would have any chance at all of establishing on these plants because I can pretty much assure that you are far away from the biological passport, as we would say, in the soil of what would align with russet mites. And no, yeah. yeah, they, yeah, I mean, even like uh, in my other garden, there was times that I would allow like dramatic drybacks just to see what the re repercussion is. And the first stage of it falling out of anaerobic or aerobic conditions was for it to have a uh, fungus gnats and then you have thrips. Mm -hmm. So once I start seeing thrip bite, that's when I'm like, okay, I need to do something to implement change. Um, but yeah, in this garden right now, everything's been so dialed in that nothing even wants to eat, to touch them. There's actually our pill bugs in the, in the bed too. There's a few of them. And in my last garden, I did have issues with them eating my plants, but mm -hmm. they don't want to touch them Yeah. in this the garden, pill, you know? The pill bugs are a weird one. Um, you know, we, we have, for some reason, certain farms that the pill bugs will eat the plants and more gardens that they don't go anywhere near it. I think it has something to do with uh, humidity and environment. And so in your current garden, you've got a troll master that's helping you out manage environment. You got some nice sure. lights, you got a little bit sure. better setup. It's in a bigger yeah. room too, I think helps. But um, I think one of the things you came up, you know, you've been kind of like the pill bug experimenter trying to get them out. Like what are some of the ways that you've tried and what are some of the ways that have worked well to get rid of those guys? Yeah, yeah. So and and I would agree with you with like the the change of when a pill bug eats a plant or doesn't eat a plant. And I will say like personally, I've noticed that anytime the biology or the mineral balance or even both are off whack, it's almost like the plant itself thinks it's dying. So mm -hmm. the pill bug thinks it's dying. So the pill bug just starts eating it. And I've noticed that with the pill bugs even my last garden that if I, you know, got a hand on the biology and whatnot, that they would stop eating the plants. Um, that was always helpful. But of course, there's that in between of you trying to get them to not eat your plants while you're going through those changes. So the first thing I tried was uh, beer traps. Um, but I am a non beer drinker. So it was always really awkward for me to <laughs> like go buy a six pack and be like, this is just for my pill bugs, you know, <laughs> and it's really gross to clean up the next day or after a few days because it basically is just fermenting in that little cup. Like you could just make like a little solo cup dish of it. And um, I don't know, it just was not really fun to clean up. So then recently I saw or not say recently, but like the last time. I had a pill bug problem. I saw a potato tech, they were calling it, which I found really helpful is, which is you just take a bunch of potatoes and you just put in their beds. And when they have, you know, taken over a potato, like you'll see them, they'll start like burrowing into the potato and they'll just start crawling all over it. You just take that potato and you eat it out in your backyard. And you're like, you can live out there now. <laughs> like <laughs> you don't need to live in these tents. And that honestly has done me the best of doing the potato tech, especially if you're on top of it, because well, for one, the potato doesn't smell and stuff. So it's not like all rotty and gross while you're working with it, like the beer traps are. Um, uh, but you can reuse them too. Like if, if the pill bugs just start to attack them, you can, you know, like I said, eat the potatoes out into the yard, go pick them back up. Usually the force of hitting the ground makes the pill bugs fall off the potato and you just pick up your potato and you just put it back in your soil bed. And you just like, anytime I've seen like a pretty big population of them, I just try to be more frequent for of how often I'm checking the potato 
and throwing it out, you know, essentially. Or you can even throw it in a five gallon bucket and just let them fall off into the five gallon bucket and dump the five gallon bucket. Because the problem with pill bugs is like their role in in the ecosystem is to eat decaying matter. So it's not like their existence is a problem. It's just their existence in my garden while my garden is going through some kind of weird funk becomes problematic because they once the lights turn off they go to town they just want to eat everything in sight and it took me a while to even figure that out because the way they eat the plants it's very like destructive and it's very erratic where you're just like looking at the leaves and are like is the leaves ripping like i actually thought it was my dogs for a second because they were taking such big chunks at a time of a of a fan leaf that i thought maybe one of my dogs was like sneaking their head in for a for a bite when i had the <laughs> the tent open you know like maybe like one day when i'm you know turning my back to do some get the watering bucket ready and then i turn around and my dog's eating a leaf or whatever so <laughs> Because that's happened too. So that's the thing too. It's like I've had my dogs literally top cannabis plants for me and they regrow and somehow look great. So it's kind of weird <laughs> how, how they can either help or hinder you, you know? So that's the low stress yeah. training and the dog stress top topping. Um, yeah, no, yeah, they've definitely helped me top some plants. <laughs> <laughs> um, we got a question here. And maybe if there's other following along, if you want to start dropping your questions in, we can get to these. Someone's asking, how sure. do we achieve high beneficial nematode populations in a living soil bed? Do either one of you ladies want to handle that one? Or? I mean, uh, I'm sure Sarah is the more experienced one, but like my personal understanding is just having enough food and biology diversity um, for the nematodes to want to be present. So if you want bacterial nematodes, you want to make sure that there's a high enough bacterial uh, population that not only are the bacteria able to reproduce, but the nematodes also have enough food to want to be happy. And same thing with the predatorials. You want to make sure there's enough predators for them to eat, but not that they eat so many that now you don't have any more amoebas because they ate them all. <laughs> it's also really important to make sure your soil remains moist enough. If you if you dip in your moisture, but you know, your nematodes will just cyst up or possibly die. So it's it's just that's why we talk about the watering the way that we do because it's one part is having the food resources and the other part is actually having the the enough water there. We've we've scared a lot of people into <laughs> underwatering um yeah. because of the overwatering that we see so often Sorry about but that. underwatering is just as as tough on the nematodes mm -hmm. i think one thing i feel like little... oh yeah good oh sorry i was just going to comment on the watering thing as an aspect of like um how the industry has changed it's hard when like someone's been a hydro grower for so long and their first instinct is to overwater because right. they've been taught to water until the water runs out of the bottom of the pots like essentially they call it like you know they piss themselves or you know they relieve themselves of all the water but in living soil like it really surprises people about how little you actually have to use to maintain proper moisture um sometimes people see me use like there's like a little hand pump sprayer you can use at time if you just want a really light dose of water and sometimes i get weird looks when i do that but then i'm like no i literally only need this much you know it's like a <laughs> gallon sprayer for a four by four and i'm like no really i only need this much water i don't like this is my feed this is my watering for the day this is like you know um doesn't need much and you don't have to be dramatic either because the nice thing is like if you can make a low compaction for when your water is actually hitting the top of that soil that's like kind of why the sprayer is kind of nice um then you're you know like i said you're not creating that compaction but the water um well, it will make its way down too. You know, it's kind of it's kind of impressive because you might water the top at first, and then you think, oh, my soil still seems dry. It's like, well, let gravity take effect. Go walk away for a couple hours. Go do a different task. Come back. Check your soil. Then, if the water that you just put down hasn't gotten down into the first, you know, couple inches of the soil, then you might need to put a little bit a little bit more. But I mean, I've definitely have underwatered at times as well, but it's kind of like that same effect of what's the dramaticness? How how far is too far? How right. far is not enough? And where's it's that Goldilocks effect, right? It's mm -hmm. like this porridge is too hot, this porridge is too cold. <laughs> this is just right. <laughs> Let's grow some weed. <laughs> yeah. And because you have the microscope at home, you can clearly tell where you're at. So when you pull mm -hmm. a sample, when you have little thrip bites, often 
the soil is dried um, or drier than it maybe needs to be to maintain ideal yep. um, populations, which will drive adding more moisture. And then you can tell again when you've gone too far because you'll start to see the presence of ciliates or stock ciliates or some of the other things that like to live in uh, wastewater. Um, yep. <laughs> and ju just for the fun fact for you out there, um, we've done direct conversions where we take a, a drain to waste coca core facility, translate it straight to living soil, use the same containers and everything. And the living soil use one fifth to one seventh the water of your typical drain to waste coca core facility. Yep. Um, mm -hmm. So significant water savings over other hydroponic techniques. And as we um, inch closer and closer to climate crisis, that's going to be important to know about. So tap yourself in either through Dr. Lane's classes or through our master classes, which are starting here pretty soon. Um, one thing that I don't think people realize about the predatory nematodes or the beneficial, um, you know, bug fighting nematodes, I guess you could say like the heterabditis and the Steiner nema. Typically, they do start to compete for resources and one will ultimately win out. And so we tend to inoculate with both the SF and the HB nematodes. Sometimes we do the SC. That's usually determined by um, environment in the greenhouse and temperatures. And we will see one of those species drop off over time. And you will then need to re-inoculate with the one that has fallen off. So they do start to compete for resources and they do start to um, uh, fall off, I guess. And you'll need to kind of track that. So if you have your own microscope, their mouth parts are fairly distinct. The SF look quite a bit different than the HBs. Um, the HB are a bacterial feeding nematode, and they're honestly kind of difficult. to. They don't have two bulbs, I find, or one's hard to see. Um, but nonetheless, one is more of a traditional bacterial feeders with the bulb, and the other one looks a little bit different. Um, so go ahead and tap into that. And so, um, one of the, did you want to have anything else on nematodes or? No, no, no nematodes. I, yeah. I had a thought on, um, just the food farmers and their mindset, but we've gone past that. So. Oh, yeah, yeah. Never <laughs> no, it's drop, okay. Drop it in. Say it. What you got? Well, I was just at, um, I run a, um, a chapter, a local chapter here of the Bionutrient Food Association. We just had our chapter meeting last night and we had a new member join us who happens to run the seed exchange here. And he was super stoked to be there and learn what I w was doing uh, with the group. And I was talking to another market gardener there and talking about, you know, teaming up with him and getting his um, bioassays and things like that. And he and uh, that other guy chimed in. He's like, well, I could never uh, I could never afford that. But like literally one conversation prior to that, he was talking about how how all the squash bugs took out. He literally didn't get any of his squash at all. It took out his entire harvest. So my point in saying that is that you pay either way. Yeah. Either you pay mm -hmm. up front and you get the harvest and you learn how to cultivate properly and have a healthy garden, or you pay in an unhealthy garden. Yeah. Yeah. It, it, or you're is, paying in, in like times, IPM management that's cool. like over exactly. costly, or you're yeah. paying for something that you don't need. And that's what's really nice about like, you know, about going through this journey is I've learned to grow a lot with so little, right? The, the yeah. commercial industry has a certain parameter of yield expectancy that they have out of a grower to consider to be a good grower. So it's, you know, either a gram per wattage situation or a pound per plant situation, you know, and something that I've even shown within my own garden space, my little four by four is even when I do the bare minimum, I could still hit the bare minimum of gram expectancy per plant based on the wattage of light that I'm using. And I'm using a very small amount of wattage of light. Being able to use a small amount of water is helpful too, because then my water bill is not running up amok. You know, mm -hmm. <laughs> I'm not paying yeah. for gallons and gallons of water. Even when I was working with the person helping us design this commercial space, they, when I told them, you know, how little water I need for a four by four space, they were, you know, they didn't conceive it. They thought I needed yeah. a much more, larger water holding tank and you know they thought i was going to use three times four times more the amount that you know i was going to use you know or i am going to use and that's so much money to save right there because i'm not using all those extra things and there's a lot of extra things that i feel like living soil people who are new to living soil they always get bought into this product that's being sold by some 
local distributor and it gets a lot of hype from different influencers and it's kind of actually really costly to the garden to the point where it's like is it really doing anything beneficial to your microbes or to your mineral balance and if so you know here are these ways that you can kind of dictate that and i've had like you're talking about fist fights i mean i had somebody <laughs> yeah. get in tears with me because he didn't want to ph water anymore and i told him hey guess what you don't have to. And I showed him two data points. <laughs> I showed him our water data point. I said, this is what the city water test at. It tests at 8.3. Then I showed a Logan lab result of my soil. And I said, this is what my soil tests at consistently, 6.5. You know, it's like, and what's the range that cannabis needs to be? 6.5. So guess what? I saved my mo myself money and time, not pHing water for four months of this harvest. You know, like to me, that's a lot of money that I'm saving just there alone, yeah. you know, yeah. or yeah. even with cloning, people make a lot of complicated <clears throat> feeds for cloning that they're really persistent on using that are costly when it's like, well, maybe I could just use just water and some yeah. aloe powder, or even if you can't afford the water, aloe powder, you might be able to, you know, afford a little, you know, you know what I'm saying? It's just like, there's things that you can do. And actually, I don't know. It's wild because Scott told me about a grow that was taking cuts at two weeks of flower and mm. only using water and then brooding. And I just did that recently and it took the plants five days to root with no nice. intervention. So it's nice. just like the plant just had everything it needed cool. to just root in five days, which honestly, as a commercial grower is nice because yeah. sometimes in a commercial spot, an employee messes up, yeah. a clone gets cut, you lose a genetic. You're like, oh crap, they're already in flower. What am I gonna do? To know that I could take a cut, you know, into week two of flower and still get a really nice healthy clone out of it. <laughs> yeah. You know, that's yeah. that that yeah. saves you that saves you money too, not losing genetics, not losing uh yeah. yeah. I'm typically not an advocate of clean cloning off of flowering populations simply because it's stressful, but it does I have mean, its yeah. place. Yeah. I just wanted to clarify that in that um some of the farms that we've seen like really do it aggressively sometimes create problems for themselves. But the sure. benefit is that you can do it. And the other benefit is while that plant is radically shoving nutrients to the top growth tips, that's where your clone is. Um, you know, yeah. the plant's moving a lot of phosphorus, um, and it can absolutely neutrify that clone tip so to speak so that it roots really well and and sometimes yeah i normally would not want to do that either i really only did it because like i said i had did a set of clones already had the plants in flowering phase week mm -hmm. one week two those clones died of that plant i didn't want to lose that genetics so right. i just you know it's kind of like one more of those extreme situations to know <laughs> Yeah. Per perfect situation to do, to do it and further yeah. practice for what you're about to get into when a whole bunch is on the line, you know? So, oh yeah. 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 Know. That's the biggest lesson that I'll be learning right now uh, exact, is, is the scaling up of it. You know, it's, right. it's nice to be able to crush in a four by four, but it's also nice to know that I'm, I know how to deal with the problems because mm -hmm. that's the biggest thing I've seen people do is once they start scaling up, if they haven't already dealt with their bug or PM issue, well, they're just scaling up that problem. Right. And that's essentially what happened to that one garden that I talked about before. You know, they had a facility that was uh, maybe 5,000 square foot, and then they bumped up to a facility that was 30,000 uh, square foot, and their little grow is having russet mite and powdery mildew problems. Well, the big grow was also having russet mite and right. powdery mildew problems, but it was just like on a large, grander scale. And that's a lot of money to be losing at that scale. Um, when you're in a four by four, you know, you just, you don't, like I said, you don't feel the failure as much right. as when you're in a commercial space, the commercial space, when you mess up, like you really, you really feel like, oh, I messed up. This is like yeah. people's paychecks and stuff like that. So, yeah. um, it's really important to me. Like I said, it's really helpful. Like, you know, what I've learned through Scott and Sarah is like I said before, is like collecting the data and staying on point to these data points and letting that be what you use to make your changes so you're not just making these like haphazardous ideas that are cost effective they're not cost effective they like waste yeah. you money you know um or take you further yeah. down into the issue oh yeah. Yeah. yeah make it to the point that my soil is no longer usable and i have to replace it there's actually a facility that i know in the current state that i'm in that after two or three years of using their soil they have now found that their soil is 
no longer good and they've tossed it and restarted to me that's a lot of that's costly on a facility yeah. that's thousands tens of thousands of dollars down the drain if you if you're trying to produce a sustainable business in living soil replacing your soil yeah. after two years is not sustainable <laughs> yeah. if financially or in principle it's not yeah. sustainable so you know i think it's um you know the nice thing is many more people are coming online with this and we're seeing hydroponic farms jump ship and get to living soil for various reasons i don't think all any really any of them are after any sort of uh, real sustainability concerns but um the cost savings and the staying in business is part of sustainability and i think i think that's something that people really disregard especially when following popular trends and whatever's hot is that part of sustainability is staying in business part of sustainability oh, absolutely. Is being financially viable and on the pathway to remaining financial viability is taking data points along the way managing soil chemistry checking in with soil biology and then having some sort of basic rep record keeping system so that you know where things went south and that you can look back like i say here and there on the show that i still have some really old shit I've got um, a calendar from the first living soil grow that Sarah and I did. And I just wrote down really basic stuff on Thursday. I just looked at it the other day, too. I'm thinking about doing a show about it. But, um, you know, on Thursday, saw thrips, you know. Well, when I got further down my road of Soil Food Web and looked at that, you know, in the subsequent years, seven days before that, I did one of the popular neem teas. Isn't that interesting? So, you know, and that was, you know, and then thrips goes away. Um, and um, what happened after we saw thrips is we did a protozoan infusion, which is a really kind of quirky tech that we don't do very often, but it's similar to a tea, similar to a tea, but it increases nutrient cycling, accelerates the delivery of nutrients. And, um, you know, noted handful of days later, thrips seemed to be lessening. And then later down the road, did another later flowering neem tea and noted in the last week or two of flower that thrips came back. And so you kind of see um, how it goes in and out. And, you know, that was really early on in our soil food web journey, but, er, you know, deep enough into soil food web that we were able to identify there's clearly some sort of association between the relationship between nutrient cycling organisms, beneficial aerobes like flagellates and amoebae that we call protozoa to the populations of bacteria that are very clearly associated with what cannabis farmers define as thrips. Um, and, you know, having the ability to quantify that or having a lab like CAT, who's an approved soil food web lab, to look at these things and help guide you into ranges that are more conducive to desirable outcomes. And, um, you know, I think it's a really exciting time to be alive. We can jump on and stream your soil test results. You know, Sarah <laughs> is set up to be able to live feed that information to the farmer at a distance in this Zoom world we live in right now. And Kat is capable of doing that as well. I think that's a fantastic, you know, it's scary as hell right now, but it's also a pretty cool time. <laughs> you know I mean? Like definitely a pretty cool time to be alive. Um, although, albeit pretty terrifying, not gonna lie. But what brings me calmness and peace is being able to quantify the agricultural process, know exactly where I stand and have the tools and the ability to correct those. And I think that, you know, is a fantastic tool. And, you know, I just have to say, like, I'm extremely proud of you, of what you've gone on your journey. You know, when I first met you, you know, you were bombing your house and bombing your ass down a mountain at 60 yeah. <laughs> miles an hour, you know, and, and, and now you're a calm, cool, cool, not that you weren't calm and cool doing that, but you know, you, you clearly have at least the amount, the basic level of confidence needed to enter proficiently into this new realm of your professional career of literally lead designer and lead cultivator of a regulated commercial facility. And I just, I'm, you know, really proud of how seriously you've taken this for so long um, you know, enjoyed the process as well. Didn't, you know, didn't make it unenjoyable, but, you know, set that determination, spoken to creation that you will be this thing, took the steps along the way and now are this thing. And I think yeah. that's 
pretty Taking rad. And it's definitely it. it's definitely yeah. a journey that takes time too, because I've noticed like people who are currently hopping on this trend trying to achieve the level of experience that I gained in five, ten years, you know? It's like it really took me that amount of time to really cultivate what I'm doing because let's see, if I'm in a four by four space, you're only getting four to five harvests a year. You know, there's only so much that I could try to achieve within those years. And even now to this day, I don't really consider myself a master or, you know, um, uh, you know, I still feel like I'm a student. I still feel like I have so much more to learn within myself. And I will say with the skateboarding, you mentioned the downhill skating. I mean, that's what taught me how to see my passion like i'm scared still you know it's a good fear but it's like when you're on that top of the hill or you're about to start this new adventure or this new um business uh it looks scary looking down at the hill because you're like oh this looks really fast and there's some crazy turns along the way and i'm probably gonna get some road rash but you know you just like find that stillness in yourself and you just launch yourself through it so you know that's that's kind of how i feel with cannabis like it does scare me along the process but it's in a good way it's like it's the adrenaline rush of it you know of uh of you know just wanting to do well you know yeah. uh, it's that same athlete aspect you know it's uh when i when i was an athlete i was always like working hard to be the top athlete of sense. So when I was a freshman, I was already a varsity level softball player. I was starting um, and I played varsity softball all through my high school career. I also did travel softball. I did travel volleyball. Like I was always trying to perform at my my highest peak and I know that I'm never there. So like, that's the thing that I kind of appreciate to be like, I'm not there yet and I still have to keep punching through because yeah. there's so much more to learn. Like I've done this for so long and there's so much more to learn. And I'll even say like, after taking the Soil Food Web course, nine out of 10 of the emails that I've gotten in the last year are students that are interested in taking the Soil Food Web course. Yeah. And they just ask, they're just asking me point blank my experience and I'm like, well, for one, it's going to take you some years. So don't expect that in six months, you're going to be an expert because you're not. In six yeah. months, you're going to almost be more confused than you were six months ago <laughs> because you just learned all these new concepts and now you want to put them to practice. And you're like, wait a minute, like I'm confused again now. Let's start over. <laughs> so it's At a journey. One... It's definitely a yeah. journey. Yeah. At least once a year, I question my entire reality with a new bit of information. It's just how it goes, man. It's just how it goes. You know, well, it's not even just with me, it's just a society, too. You know, like right. I said, if someone's on the trend that stock ciliates are the thing, I have to sit back and be like, wait a minute, what the heck is happening with this reality right now? <laughs> <laughs> I know. It gets weird. That's the hardest part when you get to a certain level of understanding of soil food web systems is seeing what most people are being told to do knowing that's ranges from moderately incorrect to downright reckless and dangerous um and still you know not pulling your hair out i went through i've gone through all stages of grief guilt shame anger you know i've done all the emotions about it now i just kind of trust that it's part of the process and it's just part of the evolution of humans figuring these things out and some people are going to torch their garden down with popular trends and crazy tea brews and it's just part of their journey, I guess. Um, but yeah, there, you know, there are those that are listening. There are those that are moldable. And I see day in and day out that those become the top 1% of the agricultural community, especially in cannabis. Um, you know, pretty much if there's a name that's very highly respected in living soil, they've at least looked into the biological aspect, either through us or you or maybe Nick Tomasini and some of the other advisors. Um, because it's extremely difficult to maintain consistency in a living soil system if you are not moderating your behavior while watching the biological systems and populations. It can tell you so much, everything from watering quantity to how your environment's affecting the soil to how the feed volumes you're delivering. It's, it's incredibly empowering and offers so much to do. Um, and I think it's so. important that um, as we learn these scientific tools, talking about, you know, people that are glorifying stock ciliates in a living soil system, mm -hmm. um, 
it's important to not use the tool to prove or to try to prove to yourself that something might be true. It, it's it's more important to allow the microbes to tell you the story, yeah. allow nature to tell you what's actually happened, not trying to not trying to use it as a tool, you know, to say, see, this thing is it's alive. Yeah. It's like, well, alive with what? You know, what yeah. are we after here? So, well, and you can there's yeah. two, what is it? Two thousand twenty eight fields of view in a um in a uh cover slip you could look all day and find a piece of fungi and call that soil fungal dominant you know and so i think that's what's really important about the method of randomizing and picking five zones on the cover slip and just letting what be there tell you and i think that's also why it's extremely important to do the quantified analysis and actually write it down because mm -hmm. one of the most interesting things for me on our journey was you could put a sample up and there's plenty of shit in the field of view. You're seeing good things. Um, but when we sat down and counted bacteria and counted protozoa and counted fungi and compared those different outcomes, even within a different facility, just a few percentage change in any one of those values can radically change the outcome. You know, powdery mildew, for example, like we did a big project. Um, it was a one acre greenhouse where we tried to identify the difference biologically between those plants that showed visible signs of powdery mildew and those right next to them that did not show visible signs. And the difference in the relationship between omycetes and what we define as beneficial fungi was extremely consistent from corner to corner of that one actual greenhouse. And um, so... And uh, to this, uh, this little comment here, mm -hmm. yeah, <clears throat> cannabis growers in living soil are actually... Uh, leading the way in learning what is uh, producing medicine in our food because mm -hmm. it's yeah. terpene, mm -hmm. terpenes and phenols and all, all those compounds that we're specifically after so we know we're very acutely aware of what yeah. actually makes those compounds and what doesn't absolutely so, it's funny you mentioned the terpenes too because i will say like uh you know working on this facility one of the biggest things we're working on is um you know, a closed loop system in which we're producing our own solventless hash. And when you speak to other solventless hash makers, they all say hands down that living soil is giving the best results for flavor, for outcome and production and, you know, overall of all those things. So, I mean, that almost like, you know, gives me more drive and courage to be like, mm. see what we're doing means more flavor. And just like Sarah says for food, I mean, I've even had food grown in living soil and you'd be surprised how a tomato or a pepper tastes compared to the conventional to the point that now when I go to the grocery store, anytime I see conventional pepper, I'm actually kind of disgusted because they look <laughs> waxy and gross yeah. and they never taste right. Honestly, it was more of like as a kid, I hated vegetables until I realized why I hated vegetables because yeah. they all taste <laughs> chemically and right. they don't taste good. So yeah. once you, once you get really good tasting produce, it really changes. Um, yeah. Yeah. Just how you look at how you feed yourself and how you mm -hmm. feed the microbes. Like you say, like how you feed the plants, what do you want to give the plants? Do you want to give them McDonald's all the time? And they, you know, cause like people can give heavy 16 to a plant and get these really big fat cola of a plant but they have no terpenes. They have no flavor to them. They have heavy metals in them. Now they're just, yeah. you know, it's no longer a medicine. It's just a, a cheeseburger from a fast food restaurant. Right. So, yeah. right. And the world needs, Amen. we got plenty of cheeseburgers, <laughs> yo. We need some living yeah. soil. And, yeah, it's crazy the returns on hash. People don't like to talk about it because they don't want to make more competition. But um, people are very quietly whooping ass in the resin world um, in living soil. Um you know, it's really common for us to take a drain to waste cocoa grower or something like that. And in their first living soil run, we'll oftentimes double the resin production. So, sh 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 you know, so, but we better not give too many secrets away. Uh, we're starting That's to, good. you know, I mean, a couple here and there, I guess is good. But um, I guess we're getting pretty close to the length we typically like to go. Um, sure. We're definitely going to have you on again. Do you have any other closing sure. things you'd like to say, Sarah or Kat? Or? No, I mean, just just uh, thank you for the inspiration that you are in, in leading the way and keeping your nose to the grindstone and treating it like it is your job and this is what you want to do and, and you, you know, taking it to the top level. I, I just have loved watching your journey and just crushing it every yeah. time. And, I, and, you know, and staying yeah. humble and being like, you know, learning the entire time. And it's just been, you know, amazing to watch you 
you know. So thank you for. Well, and I appreciate hearing that because um, yeah. I think something I say tried and true to you both all the time is that like I would not have gotten where I am here today without the guidance and the resources that both Scott and Sarah have provided with for me, regardless if it was being the homie, being in the growers group, being able to share with other you know fellow students what's going on and getting feedback from scott and sarah within the form or even taking the coursework like the coursework to me is really great because even though i took the soil food web course to do this the micro microscopy work i still don't feel the most confident so it's nice mm -hmm. when scott and sarah provide coursework that goes in just a little bit more detail just a little bit more hands-on because the soil food web isn't hands-on it's a it's yeah. an all online course it's not hands-on mm -hmm. that's the hard thing with the pandemic is it, it killed the hands-on workshop that that doesn't yeah. really exist anymore in the soil food web right. so and like i said being a visual learner i really do appreciate having those courseworks being available to me and mm -hmm. you know every time you guys make a new coursework i'm like dang it and there's another thing i'm saving <laughs> up for <laughs> because you know it's only beneficial for my own growth you know yeah. as as myself so yeah. yeah, I would definitely cool. would not be here without without the the support awesome. and help from yeah. from Cressive. So I appreciate we, it. Awesome. And we feel the same way, you know. We go through a lot of shenanigans in our journey and have, and it's like it's these one on one situations that keep us trudging through mm -hmm. the tomfoolery and shenanigans that we got to go up against. And it's just, you know, I I love my job. Like I love going to some of the largest farms on the planet and whooping ass like that. You know that feeds me to a certain degree feeds a lot of time very easy to feed the ego um and get you know big for my britches sometimes but it's it's the coaching aspect it's the teaching that actually feeds my life feeds my soul and i just i really enjoy the master classes and seeing people like you apply themselves mm -hmm. and turn that into a career you know aaron and jared and david and some of the other growers group members are applying this and it is directly affecting their life and that's just really enjoyable to me. And I just, I think all the growers group members and masterclass students, and we got a jam packed year coming up this year. And um, we'll cover more on that later, I guess. But I um, wanted to thank you all for joining today on the show. We'll definitely have Kat on down the road. And as her facility starts to get more and more real and completed, we'll definitely be talking a little bit about like that when that time comes right. But for now, thanks for tuning in. And until <laughs> next time, we'll see you all guys later. Thank you.